Well, good morning, church. Good morning. good morning. Happy Sabbath. And good morning, church, in your own home. Good morning, church. Mary, Danielle, my sweetheart, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a very blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. And of course, those here in this Sabbath School, what a delight. You have no idea how, as a teacher, your presence is vital and encourages me. So those of you at home, if you have an opportunity to come to the Sabbath School class, do so. Mary, will you pray for God's blessings on this morning? Yes, I will. Study. Let's bow our heads, please. Our gracious, kind, merciful Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for another wonderful day of life, especially on the Sabbath morning that you have given us, and we invite you through your Holy Spirit to please be here and to come into our hearts and our minds to open us up to a deeper understanding of your wonderful mercy and grace and love towards us, Amen. and that we may be able to share that with others, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. 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 Good morning, uh, Walter and Walter's sweetheart. It's wonderful <laughs> to have you here. All right. Um, this week's Sabbath School lesson is titled, Your Mercy Reaches Unto the Heaven." And the reason your mercy reaches unto the heavens is because in heaven, our God, your God, and my God is merciful. Amen. All right. So, the key text, or the key memory text, if you're an Adventist by birth like I was, the key, or the, like I am, the key text is found in Psalms chapter 57, verses 9 and 10. Psalm 57, 9 and 10, and it says, I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. Hmm. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens, and your truth unto the clouds. By the way, this is a, a psalm that was written by David. David writes it. And so it speaks of uh, a merciful God, a God that is our refuge and our deliverer, and David says in the psalm, we didn't read it all, but David says in the psalm that he is committed to fulfill Israel's calling to be God's light to the nations. And why is it? Because God is mercy. God is salvation. God is all we need in life. So here's a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson. The psalmist realized, or the psalmists in general, David and the other psalmists, realized that they are spiritually poor. Now, I feel that way often, and I'm not sure how you feel, but they realize that they are spiritually poor and have nothing good to offer to God. In other words, the psalmists feel that they have nothing in and of themselves that would recommend them before God's holy throne. And the reason for that is because of iniquity. David and the rest of the psalm. So David, um, David in Psalm 40, verses 17, David in Psalm 40, 17, does what we should be doing often. And that is, he says to the Lord, but I am poor and needy. Yet the Lord thinks upon me. Wow, he's merciful. You, O oh God, are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God, says the psalmist. So when, I'm, when I need you, Lord, don't just set it aside. Act upon it. So David and the rest of the psalmists understood or understand that they, just like all of us, need grace, God's grace. We all need the gospel. The psalms stress the fact that people are fully dependent on God's mercy. The Oxford Language Dictionary defines mercy as being, and I want you to pay attention to that, compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone 
who is within one's power to punish or to harm. Okay. The scripture, or the, the scriptural examples we will read and study this morning, and we will be doing a variety of psalms, reflect this definition. Mercy is an astounding word that inspires the human spirit with hope and motivation. Anyone suffering the consequences of poor decisions feels the crushing weight of guilt dissipate when shown mercy and grace. I feel that way when I ask the Lord to forgive me and I know that that sin has been a real problem for me. When a deadline is extended or a debt forgiven, we experience overwhelming relief and gratitude at the proffered mercy. This week we will learn about the mercy of the Creator. Mercy in the Psalms is depicted as, as its highest manifestation. This is the mercy of the only God, the true God to the sinner. The mercy of a living God ready to forgive and redeem because of His love and grace. The Psalms stress the fact that people are fully dependent on God's mercy. Fortunately, as we see in Psalm 136, God's mercy is everlasting, as evidenced in both God's creation and the history of God's people. When you ever doubt who God is, look at His creation and the history of God's people. In the presence of the everlasting God, David tells us in Psalm 103 that human life is as trans transient as grass. Now let's read it, Psalm 103, 15. Here's what it says. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. What does that say? Mm. You, you're born, you grow, and eventually you phase out. All right. But then the psalmist also reminds us, the same, the, the same psalmist, in Psalm 103, 17, that says, The mercy of the Lord is from what? Everlasting to everlasting. Is there a beginning and an end in everlasting to everlasting? I apparently not. On those who fear God and His righteousness to, children, to, to, to children's children. You know what that tells me? That God loves human beings. You know what it tells me? That God renews their strength. Human being strength is renewed by, by God. And that in God, human beings have the promise of eternity. God's people takes comfort in the fact that the Lord is faithful to his, to his covenant. Mm -hmm. Now, in summary, when we read Psalms, and we're going to read particularly Psalms 51, 103, 123, 130, and 136 in the original Hebrew, we discover that the psalmist uses Four different Hebrew words. Four different Hebrew words. Hesed, Raham, Anan, Seliha, to refer to what we call mercy. God is Raham because He is totally merciful. God is Anan because He is totally gracious. God is Hesed because He is long suffering and abiding. And, and abiding in goodness and truth. And God is Selia because He forgives, He purifies, and He restores us to His likeness. Understanding these four words and what they imply will give us a deeper understanding of the love of God and His mercy. Danielle, let's study Psalm 136. What thought predominates this psalm? His mercy endures forever is the title for Sunday, and we are assigned Psalm 136. So we're going to do a little bit of studying on that. I'm going to start first reading the first three verses of it, and then start talking a little bit about it. So if we can have it on the screen. There we go. Uh, one, two, three. I'm going to read it for now. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for
for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. This, this uh, psalm was sung in the temple services, and they usually had two choirs. Uh, as I was doing research, I've bumped on, on all this information that I never knew before. Um, and it's just I could actually picture them. So what they would do is one choir would do the first line, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And then the other choir would respond, for his mercy endures forever. And then they would continue. The left choir would go, O oh, give thanks to the God of gods. And the right choir would go, for his mercy endures forever. And so it went the entire psalm. So you can kind of see how powerful it was for them in a worship style, they were worshiping with this style, with this hymn, this uh, psalm. It wasn't just for reading, but for worshiping. As I was preparing for this lesson, I was just uh, struck again with the <coughs> idea that how amazing it is that we're studying the psalms because the psalms are a special comfort, at least to me over the years, whenever I've gone through troubled times, if I needed the Bible uh, where I couldn't really study, but I just needed comfort, I would go to the Psalms. And you read through them, and you read through them, and it's giving you comfort, but you never really, I've never spent a lot of time really deepening on them. You study, you admire, you ponder a little bit, but studying like we're doing now, it's really developing to a new level. So I wanted to point out just a few things. First of all, on the first line, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. The word for Lord that they're using here is Yehovah, uh, mm -hmm. the self-existent eternal. Mm -hmm. yep. That also happens the national, like Hebrew, like Jewish national word for God. That's how they usually, in the national way, refer to him as Ye Jehovah or Yehovah. So self-existent eternal. So this self-existent eternal, you have a picture of huge, big, and all of a sudden you say, his mercy endures forever. And the worst word for mercy here is hesed. And hesed has not only that he is long-suffering and abiding and good, but it also has divine love and loving kindness. So it's like in, it's a, you have the picture of loving kindness. So all of a sudden you have this big Yehovah, self-existent eternal, who has a loving kindness. Uh, so you, it, it's almost like at first, in your concepts of God, if you, if you see God as a big and eternal, you don't automatically think of he's going to look loving kindly on me. You just kind of see him up there big in a temple setting. But instead, he is pouring out his loving kindness on us. And then it says, oh, give thanks to the God of gods. And God here is Elohim. Elohim is translated as supreme God, exceeding God, like above all else. He is above all else. He is supreme. He is above all else. Right. And this supreme God is pouring out the same kind of mercy, the loving kindness that has said. It's used the same, it's the same exact word for mercy in the entire Psalm 136. They don't change about in this Psalm. They're only using loving kindness. So they're painting an Im amazing picture. You're going from one up with the left choir to down to me in loving kindness on the right choir. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of Lords. And this is a short for similar to Adonai, but it's Adon. And it means sovereign, master, owner, controller. So this sovereign, master, owner, controller is like he is pouring out his loving kindness, mercy on me. And when we think of mercy as he, we have it from the Oxford of compassion, forgiveness with one's power to punish, but really you don't have kindness. You don't think of kindness in that word. You just say, okay, he has the power to punish, but he's writing me off. Well, no, he's beyond writing us off. He is pouring out his loving kindness on us. And that's the beauty that this amazing psalm is painting. Now, this is not the first time in the Bible where we ran into this kind of uh, wording. In Deuteronomy, so in the Old Testament, um, it, Deuteronomy 10.17, it uses similar God of gods and lords of lords. It says, so Deuteronomy is Moses, uh, was written in the time of Moses, and it was like a follow-up review for the Israelites before they were going to enter the, the 
promised land of what they're supposed to honor and how and obey God. And it says, for the Lord of your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, using the same wording as we have in this psalm, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and nor takes bribes. So this God that you cannot move him with anything. Amen. When we go back to that <coughs> psalm, the same God is pouring his loving kindness on us. And in 1 Corinthians, that's in New Testament, that's Paul writing to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 8, 5 to 6, it says, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for there is one God, the Father, of whom are, are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. So it's the same concept as the God of gods, lords of lords, supreme over everything. Let's continue to the psalm, because we have a little bit of ground to cover on the psalm, and I actually have a little bit of texting. We have five more minutes, so continuing. <coughs> Anybody would like to read Psalm 136, 4 to 9? I'll read it. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy There's endures forever. Outside. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. So what do we see here? It's the picture of creation. That's it, creation, Genesis. Well, it, it, it's really a sustaining God. He sustains us, mm -hmm. he creates us, and he sustains us. I That's haven't finished. A, yeah. So uh, a creator, we see the creation of him, and literally if we're going to Genesis 1, 9 to 10, which I'm going to read fairly quickly, we can see the same concept. He's literally, the psalmist is literally taking the exact creation account, and he's putting it in this uh, mercy endures forever. I mean, he is great wonders. I mean, when we're looking at great wonders, He's unrivaled. He's an unrivaled miracle worker. And creation itself is an unrivaled miracle. We, can't, we don't have any equality to it. So in Genesis 1, 9 to 10, it says, Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And it continues in verses 14 through 19. I'm going to skip to that. Then God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Let them be the lights of the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning. So we can see exactly, I mean, the great lights, the rule by day, he's, he made the sun to rule by day, the moon stars by night. And this amazing God that made all these incredible things that we look in awe at is, go ahead. And the only way <coughs> I understand that that night and day could happen is the precise location of the moon relative to the sun and the earth that a gravitational force permits the earth to turn. If the moon were located just a little bit closer to the sun or closer to the earth, the earth wouldn't rotate. So there's, it's just fascinating. That's correct. Yeah. The precise this Correct. precise, amazing exactly. God Correct. is looking down in loving kindness has said over us. Every Amen. other line. and every It's like amazing how the psalmist is able to portray the big and then the loving kindness in the next line. The amazing lights and the sun to rule by day. The loving kindness pouring over us. Amen. Uh, and his mercy endures forever. This loving kindness is not a temporary thing. It's a forever eternity. Let's continue, and who would like to read for me Psalm 136, 10 to 16? To 
to him who struck Egypt when their firstborn for his mercy and goodness and brought out Israel from among them with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two for his mercy and doors for him. Continue all the way to 16. Can we go down to 16? Go ahead. Oh, and did not just read. Oh, no, I read most pages. And made Israel pass through the midst of it for his mercy endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his army <coughs> in the Red Sea for his mercy endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness for his mercy endures <coughs> Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at the wilderness passing, but to the Israelites, this was something that they've experienced and they've heard as children hearing from their families over and over and over. They experienced vividly the stories, and they re they're being, uh, basically he's underlining with every step of that salvation that they, he provided and the miracles that he provided that he was looking in, in, in amazing love down over them as he was doing that. So I am going to go on to Exodus 13:21. In the yes, Walter. Yeah, I, oh, oh, Walter first, and then me. Uh, Walter first. Israel, Walter first, and then. When Israel, Walter. oh, I'm sorry. When Israel was in Egypt as a slave, and God permit them to be free, during the, his walking at the desert, they was complaining all the time. Yep. And God was having, who can have more mercy and more patience than God? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, now, we are not in Egypt, we are not the desert, but we are walking in our life like a being in a desert with a lot of pro problems, a lot of things happen in our life. Even that, we are supposed to say, his mercy is forever. Right. Because he repeats 26 times. That's exactly right. What does that mean for me? Why he repeats 26 times? Because we have to be sensitive to God all the time for everything. Amen. Not only for one thing. And even even for, for bad things that happen in our life. Or for good things. For the how we have, the work, and for uh, being healthy or whatever. We have to be central, central to God all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. But no, but but sometimes we forget that, you know. God is so 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 lovely to us, so mercy, and we forgot to to appreciate all of these things, and we start to be complaining. Absolutely. You know? So this is where the sustaining part came in, really, for them, providing and sustaining. Go ahead. Yeah, what he was doing in the previous <coughs> section is citing evidence from their history. Correct. And Ellie and I, when we were studying, we tried to go over the specifics in our background, our immigration, mm -hmm. to come to the United States to get an education mm -hmm. from Norway. It was not easy. Right. Quite a commitment. Right. And then my, my mother's prayers made our situation Catholic. Father made it. it, it and then we recite these, and that's exactly what they're doing. Exactly. And it's important for speaking for ourselves to go over the evidence. Exactly. So, what we're basically saying exactly. is God doesn't need to remember these things, His memory is perfect. Right. We are the ones that we're singing for. We're doing the praise to God really as a total and complete and continuous reminder of his providences so we could remember in every moment when we need him. Yes. Exactly that. Uh, when I'm looking at, uh, I pulled Exodus because, uh, you know, he, to him who led the, his people through the wilderness is how did he lead them? We know very well. And in Exodus 13, 21, it says, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night i mean as people if he would have never provided that we would have never faulted him but god doesn't work like that he thinks beyond our cap capabilities our imagination he works in wonders and ways that if we think we're stuck 
he will open the Red Sea. If we think we're stuck against, the, he'll open the, 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 the Jordan River. He will put a pillar of cloud in front of us and he will put a covering uh, above us. He will sustain us. Oh. So I'm going to rush a little bit now to the yeah, end part on in. Psalm 136, 17 to 22. To him who struck down great kings for his mercy endures forever and slew famous kings for his mercy endures forever. Sion, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage, for his mercy endures forever. A heritage to Israel, his servant, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. And these are the two kings that when they were going through, uh, trying to go to the, being after the desert, going to the promised land, they were not allowed to go through and they were uh, attacked by him, but God provided success in defeating them. So he provided protection on the way as they were being attacked by enemies. And there, he's reminding, reminding them of that. And then verses 23 to 26 in Psalms 136 says, who remembered us in our lowly state for his mercy endures forever and rescued us from the enemies for his mercy endures forever who gives food for all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. So what we see in quick uh, succession in this psalm is, first, a God's supreme master owner with a divine love, and the divine love of loving kindness that endures forever. Uh, he has created the great wonders of creation. Every miracle that we can experience in our life comes from him, including everything that we are surrounded about. He, deliver us, he delivered them miraculously from Egypt, and he delivers us miraculously through our Egypt. He continued to deliver them afterwards and slew their enemies on the way. And then he rescued them from perishing in, on, and provided in every aspect of their lives. It's the same with us. And when are we supposed to, to worship him? Forever, continuously, and always. Amen. Amen. I used to like to say something short. God is love. Where is his high expression of love from God to us? At the cross. In Jesus Christ. Amen. When he brings his song, how much, how, uh, how, how much proof you wanted from him to, to prove you how much he loved you? Absolutely. For uh, any I recommend to think about that sacrifice. Every day. Every day. Ponder on the cross. Every day. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Danielle. Mary, King David appeals to God for mercy. Please, uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad to explain what it was. Alrighty, good morning, everyone. Happy morning. Sabbath. Sabbath. So we're going to review Psalm 51. And in keeping with the study of God's mercy this week, this psalm depicts mercy in its highest manifestation. And it's the mercy of God, the Holy One, toward the sinner. The mercy of a God ready to forgive and redeem because of His grace. Nothing that we've done. It's all about His grace. Amen. So we're going to study three aspects of God's mercy and how it relates to us. So the first one is... Why appeal to God's mercy? Secondly, how is God's forgiveness of sin portrayed in this psalm? And lastly, what's the goal of divine forgiveness? But first, let's get a little background to Psalm 51. It was written by King David. After his coronation, he is king now. It's a prayer of confession and it's one of the most, if not the most, earnest and contrite prayer on record in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that King David wrote this after he was visited by the prophet Nathan. And that was after King David's affair with Bathsheba. Yeah. So this was during, yes, we'll, get, we'll cover that a little bit in just a bit was during a very dark time in his life. So if I can have someone please read <clears throat> Psalm 51, one to five. 
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me truly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may find just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin, and uh, my mother conceived me. Thank you, Eva. Good to see you back. <laughs> so, according to these verses, why does David appeal to God, or what does David appeal to God for? He's appealing for his mercy. Okay, and in fact, we have these definitions in the very first verse. There are three of these words That's used right. in that verse. Mm -hmm. Good morning, happy Sabbath. We have um, Hanan used, have mercy on me. That's Hanan. And according to your loving kindness, that is Hased. And then according to the multitude of your tender mercies, that word is raham. So it's fascinating that in the first verse, David is asking God earnestly, he's using three of the various forms um, of mercy depicted for God. He's also appealing to God's mercy for forgiveness. David is asking for forgiveness. He's again in this very spiritually dark moment in his life in verse 1, what's, what does it say at the very end, the last four words of verse 1? Blot out, Blot out my transgressions. Now, what transgressions is David referring to? He had had an illicit affair with Bathsheba, then murdered. he had him killed, and he lied to her husband, Uriah, right? He was trying to... Um, deceive him in various ways, and you can read this in the scriptures. So he has this weight of guilt on him, and he's asking God for forgiveness. And God's forgiveness is an extraordinary gift of grace, and it's the result of, verse 1, his tender mercies. The multitude of his tender mercies, the result of that is forgiveness. Yes, Eva. Oh, okay. Sure. And so I, I would also say that he brought shame on God's name. Yeah. So yep. not only did he transgress, yep. transgress the sins against men on this last six, you know, no, from six to, you know, whatever, the last, the yes. last six commandments. Yeah. But he also transgressed against God himself, and that's why he says they're against you and you only have a sin. He brought shame on God's name. Thank yeah, you for pointing that out. There yes, are three points of uh, lessons that I take out of this David. You know, first of all, he acknowledged his sin. Yes. He admitted to God. You know, a lot of us we don't we, we deny it. Well, I don't do anything wrong, you know. And then he asked for mercy. Lord, God, all my iniquity. I'm Contrite heart. Exactly. Contrite heart. Exactly. Thank you. In verse 3, he says, For I acknowledge my transgression. He wasn't trying to bury it. He wasn't ignoring it. He wasn't excusing it, which many times I know I'm tempted to do that or to justify, well, I'm just trying to justify myself. He's saying, No, Lord, I acknowledge it, but I'm asking you for your mercy. And this appeal is based on God's divine character, right? He says in verse 1 again, according to your loving kindness. And what is God's character? In Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7, Moses was talking to God. And in it, God, he asked God, show me who you are. I want to see your glory. I want to see your character. And God says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. That's God's definition of his own character. It's who he is. 
And it, God continues, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Did you have a question? Two things. Number one, David recognized his sin. There are many in the world that never recognize it and go on living the same way and they multiply the deaths of affair. Number two, that is verse three, is mental health. I mean, <clears throat> if you keep going over this thing in your mind and can't get out of it, it drives you mad. That's right, and there's only one or, answer Or to else that. just deny it completely. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, Cindy. What's the Exodus verse you just It's Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. And so, as we move on with this, one of the other aspects of this is how is God's forgiveness of sin portrayed in this psalm? We haven't read it yet, but um, Brian, if you could please put up verse 7, 51, 7. Um, hopefully you have that. If not, you don't. Okay, I'll read it. In verse 7 it says, Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And in verse 2 we had read, you don't have to change it, we could leave it there. He said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquities. So God's forgiveness is displayed as a cleansing experience. Amen. That's right. what we need. King, exactly. Right. Um, hyssop, how many of you know what hyssop is? I, know, I, I had to look this up, but it's a small, bushy, bushy yes. aromatic mm -hmm. plant. Mm -hmm. And in Jewish rites, it was used yeah. for purification. Right. So David here is desiring purification. He wants to be cleansed, rid of this sin, this guilt, this iniquity, because he feels this guilt and iniquity has banned him from God's presence. By the way, that was used in the sanctuary in the, in the purification of the Israelites as they, uh, as they came to the sanctuary for purification. Yeah. Esau was used So that's what he's seeking. Yeah. Yes, Walter. Mm -hmm. For here, I was asking myself, what I mean, please me with Esau. What is, what is, I know we can use it to clean our ear, but what I mean here, remember when uh, Israel was in Egypt and, and Moses says, your, uh, your first kids are going to die. So one of the Israel people, he came with, with blood in one container plus a hizo. Exactly. Yeah, that's yes. how they and that purified blood. blood. And that blood right. was from what animal? Lamb. lamb. From the lamb. From the lamb. The lamb was representing who? Christ. Jesus Christ. Exactly. So that in a symbolic way, exactly. the blood of Jesus Christ is going to protect you. Exactly. It's going to make you free to die. Exactly. So thank you. For thank you. Yes, because there's a connection again of the cleansing, the purifying. The, and through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ. Yep, can exactly. I, it's only I, through His blood that we can be forgiven. Can I add a little bit to this? No, we studied last night about minor prophets, right? There are two books in heaven. One book of life and one book of death. So what David did with the contrite heart uh, book of as for mercy. Yeah, life book of death. death. So book of death is everything what we think, everything what we say, everything what we do. Including what, even though we don't say it, but we talk about it, evil surmising, negative, right. and stuff like that. That's one of the books. So what David did here, ask for forgiveness, and God will erase that. Amen. He erase that. That's sin. right. He blots it out. He blots it out. So um, we're running out of time here, but the last um, appeal that... Um, or result of this forgiveness, I should say. It's not appeal, but the goal of divine forgiveness is found in verses 10 through 12. And I'll read through those, in there, through those quickly. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew 
a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. So God's forgiveness is more than just a legal proclamation of innocence, okay? From here we see it does three things. It changes us. It produces a profound transformation that reaches the innermost part of the human self, our heart. That's why he says, create in me a clean heart. Hold on, I'm just going to go through all this and then we'll um, get to your questions. Secondly, it reunites us with God. He brings us back into his presence and he gives us his Holy Spirit. And lastly, his forgiveness restores us Amen. by giving us his salvation and upholding us our joy is complete. So God's forgiveness brings out a new creation in the creating a clean heart, a pure heart, and a steadfast spirit. And here the Hebrew word for create is bara, which depicts a divine creative power that only God can do. It can't be done by anyone else. You had a question. <coughs> And that <clears throat> transformation of the individual seems to me is what makes the sin in the so-called book invisible and disappear. It isn't God as, acting as a CPA, checking this and checking that. It's the transformation of the human being makes that disappear. Yeah, yeah can, can I put it in a different way? Yeah, in a little, in a different way, because that's dead on, dead on. So when, jo when God cleanses you, not only is your heart cleaned, but the book of deeds is raised out. Erased. Okay? So remember that. The, the action of heart cleaning, which is what you were mm -hmm. describing, goes end in end with blocking out any deed that caused sin. And yeah, the and the blotting out disappear. It's exactly and blotting out. Right, right. That's exactly. And hmm. and that's the reason for the hyssop, because the hyssop was at the when whenever they left Egypt, they put the blood on the doorpost with the hyssop, and also they used hyssop to sprinkle blood on the altar. So it was all representative of Christ's forgiveness. Okay. And lastly, I just want to end with a quote from Sister White on the creating a clean heart. This um, prayer and. She says, create in me a clean heart. This is beginning right. So this is where to start. At the very foundation of Christian character, for out of the heart are the issues of life. Mm. The needed grace is provided and the power of the Holy Spirit will work with every effort you make in this direction. We need to open our hearts to the influence of the mm. Spirit and to realize its transforming power. Oh, there we go, it's up there now. The reason why you do not receive more of the saving help of God is that the channel of communication between heaven and your own souls is clogged by worldliness, love of display, and desire for supremacy. While some are conforming more and more to the world's customs and maxims, we should be molding our lives after the divine model, and our covenant-keeping God will restore unto us the joys of his salvation and uphold us by his free spirit, as King David proclaimed. Amen. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. I hope that you are enjoying the way we are going through scripture and we dissect it and explain it. I really you, you appreciate that. Uh, it takes a, a lot longer, but it is a lot healthier. That's the way that I would like to put it. Um, Tuesday's lesson, we are going to really uh, concentrate on Psalm 100. And uh, you, you, I, I don't know, you, you've already seen mercy expressed in Raham, Anan, Hesed. And in Tuesday, we are going to spend significant time talking about Selim. Very hard as far as that mercy is concerned. By the way, 
as Mary mentioned, most psalms include at least two or three of those. Most psalms, most, most psalms really appeal to a mercy that is greater than just a single bite of mercy, if I can put it that way. Okay? All right. So, in Psalm 130, we're going to look at an affliction and a concern we're going to look at what the problem is for that affliction and that concern. Then we're going to look at a potential solution. So, who's the solution and what is that solution composed of? By the way, most psalms are that way. And so, I want to dissect the psalm this way so that we can actually unpack it and put it together. So, Psalm 130. In Psalm 130, the psalmist and we don't know who the psalmist is, but the psalmist expressed the affliction he and his people feel for the sins they have committed. By the way, most psalms without authors probably are part of David's own psalms. David had writers that wrote psalms. So, 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 so uh, some of the psalms, you see the psalm of David, you read this, this is the psalm of David, and other psalms, you either have a, a scriber and the name of the scriber, or no name at all, which really means that David and the scriber did it together. Okay? I wanted, I wanted you to have that, that information. So, so here, uh, in Psalm 130, the psalmist expresses the affliction he and his people feel for the sins they have committed. Their sins are so grave that they threatened to separate them from God. So what's the problem here? They know they're sinners. The psalmist knows he's a sinner. The people of God knows that they sin. And they feel that there could be some separation. Why do they feel that way? Because of what the Word of God says. So what's the problem then? What is the problem? Well, let's look into this. In Daniel chapter 7, 9, and 10, and I'm not going to read that for the sake of time, the, it, Daniel tells us, he paints this picture, that the heavenly court over which God himself presided, in verse 10 he says, was seated and the books were open. Uh, what does that speak of? Judgment. Judgment. So what is the concern of a Christian? Or, or, or a, Christian, a, a Christian? What is the concern of a person that knows his sins, his judgment, judgment. In Revelation chapter 20, the Apostle John describes that he saw in vision a great white throne and God who sat on it. Let's look at that verse, Brian, Revelation 20, 12. Can somebody read that for me? And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Right. And then in Exodus chapter 32, 33, if we can put that up. <coughs> Alisa, read that as well for us. God yet, tells Moses. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. Right. So can you see the concern? And if you look at David, for instance. Uh, and David, uh, uh, we know his sin, so it's easy to speak about David. So when we look at David, wasn't he concerned? Mm -hmm. After all, he saw what happened to Saul. He saw how Saul really ended up. He followed Saul. And he's looking at that and saying, boy, I, I don't want to go that, that route. I don't want to journey that way. There is that sort of a concern. So the problem is that ultimately... We are going to be judged. And so there was an affliction and a concern. So what's the solution? How do we resolve the problem? So let's go into the Psalms. So in Psalm 130, the psalmist appeals to God's mercy for forgiveness, which will eradicate the records of sin. And here's, here's the appeal. Psalms 130, verses 1 and 2. Can, can somebody read that? So, verse 1 tells you that the psalmist really is in deep distress. 
deep distress. But he does something that you and I need to do whenever we feel just like the psalmist. He recognized that God delights to answer prayers under such circumstances. So what does the psalmist do? He prays to God. He supplicates. He pleads for his case. That's what he does. And so, when the depths of despair overwhelm you and I, and you and I feel as if we are drowning, Cry out to God. He hears you and I, and he will rescue us. God is the solution. That's really what this psalm is saying. God is the solution. We're going to unpack now this solution a little bit. Because not only do, do we need to, to know that God is the solution, but we need to know what to do to get to God. Okay? So let's do that. So, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 103, 130. Verses 3 and 4. Can somebody read that to me? If you, Lord... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, could, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Well, there you go. The, the title of Tuesday's lesson is very clear. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, is the title of Tuesday's lesson. What is the psalmist really saying? If you are going to judge, and if you are going to be truthful to judgment, and I am guilty, how am I going to survive? How am I going to live? See, that's really... That's really what, what is said here. And so, um, oh, who could be saved? If I have no, no chance of being saved, does anyone else in my household does? Does anyone else that I know would be able to be saved? Because the Bible tells you and me that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. <coughs> David. He knew very well that, he knew very well. Of course, he made mistakes like a, any human. But why he appealed to God? Why not to appeal somebody who is love, who has right. mercy? Mm -hmm. He knows he's gonna pay the consequence. But his big problem was spiritual. Correct. He was feeling a part of God. For us to feel a part of God, is the worst thing that can happen to us after we know who is God. Right. So he was, and he, he, know, he knew all his sins was written in the book of heaven. And he want God to erase those sins in confession. Because he want to see his name correct. in, the, in the, the book of the life. That's correct. Thank you, Walter. Can I, can I add to that? This is also the prayer of David for the nations, for the whole. It is. It is, us, it is a prayer for the nation, us. verses 7 and 8. We yeah. haven't got there yet. The book of Psalm is the, the book of realization of the spiritual core, and nothing good come out of us. Right. The over to God. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to, I'm, I'm looking at the time, and I'm saying, wow, how do I unpack everything I want to unpack? <laughs> so I'm going to, to I'm going to be very, very concise. Very quick, very short. Can I do that? <laughs> Will you allow me to do that? Okay. So in verses 4, verses 4 really talks about, uh, it, it comes to the Lord and says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Could I be saved? But then he says, But Lord, there is forgiveness in you that you may be, for, that you may be feared. And so... In reality, verse 4 says, You are a seliar mercy, merciful God. But God's forgiving mercy. Um, the Hebrew expression seliar tells us that forgiveness is an act of God alone. The foundation of forgiveness is the mercy of God. The prophet Micah, if we can, uh, Joel, if we can go into Micah, Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, paint, paints a beautiful picture of God. Here's what, here's what it says. Who is a God like you? Who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? 
You do not stay angry forever, for but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will treat our sins underfoot. What does that mean? You will tread it underfoot. What does that mean? Step on it. You step on him until they are nothing. Okay. And then he goes on to say, and earl all our iniquities into the depth of the sea. That's a merciful God. That's who God is. So this is the solution. What is the solution? Turning to God. What is the solution? Being God, God faithful, God obedient. You know, having a relationship with God. You see, the psalmist knows that God is not angry by nature. He knows that God's love is everlasting. He knows that God's anger is aroused only by man's failure to appreciate his love. That's the only time God is angry. The purpose of God's anger is not to wound, but to heal man. When you think that God is angry with you, don't run away. Know that he wants to heal you. It is not to destroy, but to save his covenant people. Hosea, can we read Hosea chapter 6 verses 1 and 2? And it says, Come, let us return to the Lord. What an appeal by the prophet. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. I hope that you notice verse 2. What is verse 2 really says? That Jesus' death at the cross, you mentioned it. Jesus' death at the cross cleans you and you become clean in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. That is the God redeeming. All right, uh, I'm not going to, to spend a lot more time because that's God's solution to you and to me. He provides the solution. He wants you and I to have a relationship with God and to trust Him because He's merciful. That's this week's lesson. And so very quickly, uh, in verses 5 and 6, uh, the psalm really tells us how to find mercy and forgiveness. It says, verses 5 and 6, I will wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in His word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who wait for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. The answer to a relationship is to wait on the Lord every day, and then to do what? To be grounded in His Word. If you don't know God's Word, if you don't have a relationship with God, then you should be doubting what is going to happen to me. Yes? What exactly does wait on the Lord mean? Wait means that you patiently and consistently accept and await to walk with the Lord every day, 24-7, 365. That's the expression. Wait on the Lord. In other words, don't make a decision without God helping you make a decision. Don't make a move without the Lord helping you to make a move. Don't make decisions and actions without God being part of those decisions and actions. But sometimes the decisions we make unconsciously are led by God. Yes, that's correct. That is correct. But that is correct. So it's, it's if you have a relationship with God, exactly. then that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a couple of good examples in the Bible about whether or not people waited. So Abraham was given a promise, and as the years went by, he took things in his own hand and you know, took, took a slave woman for a wife so he could have a child, not waiting on God's. And look at what that resulted in, right? Yeah, right. And then there's David, who was anointed, and it was 10 years before he was brought to um, you know, the, the, the throne. But right. he had the opportunity in his, in, in his skirmishes with Saul to actually kill Saul. Remember that cave Correct. story? Correct. But he would not do it because Saul was the anointed, the anointed. of the Lord. Exactly. So he waited on the Lord for the Lord's timing to do things in the way the right. Lord wanted to. And that's what it means to wait on the Lord. That is correct. That is absolutely. By the way, last night when we had uh, a series, I want to invite you to, to come to Friday night's meeting. We are unpacking 
12 minor books. Minor profit, minor profit books. Yeah. Every Friday night. Every Friday night. Yeah, right here. Right in this one. Uh, and I, I tell you, it's incredible to see how God works. Um, Edom, and Edom, Edom, which is Esau and Jacob, the two brothers. Edom, the kingdom of Edom, caused significant, significant hurt to the Lord. Significant hurt to Israel. Significant hurt to the people of God. And the Edomites were only destroyed much later. Much later. By, by That's a description yeah. of God's love. And predicted by God. And predicted by God. Yeah. All right. Um, I think I said enough. I didn't finish verses 7 and 8, but uh, Eva summarized it well for us. So let's go into uh, uh, Wednesday's lesson. God is both majestic and merciful. Can you explain that for us? So on Wednesday, we're, it's called Praise to the Majestic and Merciful God. And we are spending time in two psalms, two sm short psalms. 113 is the first one. So let's start with 113. But before we go into 113, I want to read uh, Matthew 26, 30, which is the right before that. And the reason I want to read that is because Psalm 113 through 118 were psalms that were used during Passover by the Israelites, and they would sing them. So Jesus actually sang this psalm. We have evidence in the Bible, in this text and another, uh, in, in the Gospels, that he sang this song because it was part of the Passover celebration, and he celebrated that with his disciples. And it says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So before his situation on the Mount of Olives, which we know so well, before his crucifixion, he actually sang this psalm. And let's read the psalm. Psalm 113, 1 to 3. Anybody would like to read it? Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Let's stop for now just here at verses 3, 1 to 3. So if we can imagine Jesus saying, praise the Lord. I mean, he's our total example. And praise the name of the Lord. And when we're talking about the Lord here, the Lord here is Yah, is short, short, not Yahweh, it's Yah, it's short for Yehovah. And it means the self-existent eternal. Um, he, so Jesus is giving praise to the Lord as the self-existent eternal. And he says, praise all servants of the Lord. We are all servants. He was calling himself a servant of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. So in, in this psalm, it's really, and we'll see that as we continue, it's what we're supposed to do, when supposed to do, and how. And so this, this is very interesting. I mean, when? From... The going time forth and forevermore from the going of the sound all day, continuously, nonstop. That's really what we're supposed to, to do. And how we're supposed to praise his name. And who are we supposed to praise? It's all in the psalms repeatedly. Um, and why? I, wanted, I pulled a quick text to show you why we're supposed to praise him. In Romans 1, 20 to 22, uh, it says, I'm going to skip to verse 21, because, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. So if we do not praise God, if we don't glorify, if we do not constantly ponder the fact like we did in the other Psalms that we were studying on Sunday's lesson, and we don't acknowledge his continuous providence in our life, we will become like that. It's like we will lose connection with God we will lose our faithfulness and will become futile in our thoughts. So it's like our health connection, just like it was for David and so on and so forth, it's by staying with the Lord and praising him continuously. So it's a very short, powerful psalm. Then continuing in verses four to six, if you, Alisa, can you read on further? Mm -hmm. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high? who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. So when we're looking at this, we continue to see the same pattern. 
who, when, how, where. So we are praising the Lord who is above all nations. It's almost carrying the same repeat idea of self-existent, eternal, all-powerful and in heaven. And who are, who are we like him? No, we're not. And where does he dwell on high? And he humble, who humbles himself to behold. So he comes down to our level. That's really what he's saying here. And he looks at our earth. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so I would see, you know, what you're describing in terms of the comparison between, like, us as humans and the Lord, you know, that, that's true. But I think there's another meaning here, which is there were all the other gods around, right? All these pagan gods. <laughs> and, and the psalmist is saying, who is like the Lord who is high above all, all nations and above all the heavens, right? So he's above all gods, all principalities, all powers, and certainly all humans. Like that is what the psalmist is saying. Absolutely. And then, uh, I want to read Daniel 2.21 because it's describing him further and makes the same connection. And he says that, Daniel says that this God, he, capital H, changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And then we continue in Psalm 1, uh, verses 7 to 9, Psalm 113. He raises the poor out of the dust, lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may seat him with princes. So he'll take someone from the dust and the dirt and he'll make them into someone he grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. I mean, already as I'm looking at the psalm, I already have visions of Joseph, who was taken from being a slave and became second in command in Egypt and saved his own country. I mean, he became something we read over and over and the whole world knows about for, it, for so many centuries. And then another smaller example is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was... Uh, Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson, uh, who his whole family died when Saul died, and Jonathan died. His, son, his father died, and he was lame in both feet. As, right. as they ran with him, he became lame, and he was now destitute, poor, and nothing. From being the grandson of a king, he became nothing. But through, heir to the throne. But an heir, he had been an heir to the throne, but now he was nothing. And David, through God's inspiration, was sent uh, when he was king, and he said, is there someone left in Saul's household? And he basically picked him up from the dirt, gave him all his uh, Saul's possessions, all of the land of the grandfather, gave it to him, and then he said, now you're going to eat at my table for the rest of your life, and that's what happened. So God, in his providences, does things like that that we can't even fathom. Mm -hmm. And then when he says, like a joyful mother of children, Hannah comes to mind when, with Samuel, who was barren and made the prayer to the Lord and the Lord provided. And then she in faithfulness turned him to service. So that's it on Psalm 113. I have to move on to in very little time for Psalm 123. So let's look at Psalm 123. And Psalm 123 is a prayer for relief from contempt. When we looked up Psalm, the first Psalm we read, 113, there was no verse of mercy. There was nothing of mercy in that Psalm but it's just of his providence was very evident and us needing to praise him on that. But on Psalm 123, I'm going to read it. It says, unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. And when I'm looking at, at, at that, uh, we're lifting our eyes to the Lord who is in heaven. He is our source. If we don't, like if we're not looking to the source, we're lost. The source is him. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their masters. He is our master, and that's how we're looking. We're looking like when you have someone overseeing you, you look to, to him to provide. So when we are in need of anything, that he is our source. Uh, so your eye look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. And this mercy is Hanan. God is gracious. So we look to him because he gives to us in his graciousness. And gracious means, uh, the way in this word is, is spelled out, it means generous to words, take pity. And sure enough, he is. And when, how long? Until he has mercy on us. We are not to give up. 
He is our source at all times, and no matter what circumstances, we are to keep our eyes fixed on him for our source. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for the same word, mercy, Hanan, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, with the contempt of the proud. And that's a very interesting turn in this psalm. When we're looking at that, I had to look up a few texts to kind of try to help us out in God's view of what it means to have, some, to, be, to have scorn towards someone that's at ease and contempt of the proud. And so I found Ezekiel 1649. Ezekiel 1649. Joel, I need Ezekiel. There we go. Thank you. Look, this was the iniquity of our sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Now, we know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. They were so well off that they started having different pastimes to the point where they depraved themselves to, a po mm -hmm. to the point where God had to destroy them because there was no saving them. So that's what happens when you have abundance of idleness. And then Zechariah 1.15, I'm exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry and then helped, and they, and they helped, but with evil intent. So when someone's at ease, God is not just looking, you know, some people say, okay, I don't need God, I can do good on my own. Well, that good is just like that with evil intent. Our goodness that comes, comes only when we are connected to God and we are not to be at ease and idle. He has purpose and plans for us. I have to switch it over. I'm already past my time, and we're on the end stretch. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> How is God's mercy portrayed in Psalm 103? So Psalm 103 identifies the Lord's manifold blessings and um, that we obviously receive through his mercy again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through all of Psalms 103. It's not that long. It's 22 verses. And then we'll highlight what does it mean, right. forget not all his benefits. Right. So Psalm 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Mm -hmm. Who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and who, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Right there are three, three of those words. Right. And once again, it's amazing how God is just giving us a fuller understanding of his mercy. Right. Verse 9 continues, He will not always chide, and that means strive or scold, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Right. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. That word is mercy. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion, compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. 
verse 20. Um, we're down to the last three verses. Oh, you don't have those. Okay. I'll read 20, 21, and 22. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all his places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So we can see that the psalmist highlights all of God's benefits. And that word for benefits actually means his treatment of right. you. Right. Um, it's in the way he has given you blessings. As you were sharing earlier, you recite, right. you guys were remembering Correct. how God has led you right. in the past, how God has blessed you in the past. Right. And this is what King David is saying here. Amen. Don't forget, but remember. Actually, that's, that's a beautiful thing. I'm going to try to remember to share that with my husband. That we should sit more regularly and review Amen. all of the blessings that we've received from God. How he has treated us in the past. Jim. And for me, the whole point of all of this interesting yes. theology in these words is for me to remember the family history, Amen. going to the background and Amen. the important moments and, and mention that because it's evidence. Of God's existence exactly. and his and, interaction. And that's growth and brings you closer, it seems to me. Yes, Amen. 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 So we're going to go back to, hopefully you have um, verses 3 to 6. There we go. So in these verses, David is mentioning the blessing or the benefit of a flourishing life. Would someone like to reread those, just those few verses there? Who forgives all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Who satisfies you with good? so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Amen. Thank you. So that's what a flourishing life, life consists of. That's what God desires to give us, and he gives us. It's forgiveness, healing, redemption, steadfast love, mercy, satisfaction, righteousness, and justice. Who doesn't want that in their lives? He also mentions the benefit or blessings are grounded in God's gracious character and faithfulness. If you have, yes, these um, verses, if someone would like to read these from verses 8 to 12. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always try, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Thank you, Vivian. And this is wonderful imagery of God's compassionate, tender, boundless, and infinite mercy and love towards us. And in all his benefits towards us, God remembers that we are frail and transient, and he has compassion on his people. Verses 13 and 14, um, if we have those, I'll read those. As a father shows compassion to his children, there he's telling us, look, you are my children. Those of you who are fathers, you know the kind of love you have towards your children. So the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. And that word there is to revere, who honor, who respect him. It's not out of a fearfulness, being afraid. It's not that at all. And he continues, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. We're fragile. We're here but for a small amount of time. And so these verses also tell us when God remembers he acts. So remembering isn't just a cognitive activity for him. 
It involves a commitment that's expressed in action. He delivers and sustains us, as is manifested through this psalm and through so many of the psalms. And this psalm beautifully illustrates God's immeasurable greatness of his grace. So we see his loving kindness and tender mercies. How are we to respond to that? Praise. Thank you. In fact, verse 1, what did he start out with? Bless the Lord, O my soul. He's saying we should bless the Lord. Now, some of us may think, well, how can we bless the Lord? Because doesn't he bless us? Well, God is the source of all blessings. We know that. But we can bless him by thanking and praising him for his goodness towards us, by revering him for his gracious character. Are we living lives like that? Are we always thankful? Are we always praising him like Danielle covered earlier? We should be praising him from when the sun comes up till the sun goes down. And obeying is a form of praise. Amen, amen. That's definitely a form of praise. So according to this Psalm, one way that we remember his and we respond to the benefits that he has given us is we praise him. A second way is we manifest and demonstrate his mercy towards others. We need to be as merciful towards others as our Father is towards us. Amen. Right. Amen. Definitely, including God to others. Um, the psalmist uses Hanan to reflect a person's kindness to a neighbor. Are we kind to our neighbors even when they're maybe not so kind to us or they're outright mean and ornery towards us? Um, he also refers to that in aiding the poor as we have our homeless ministry and there's so many other ministries that reach out. Do we express and demonstrate mercy towards others in that respect? And how else do we respond to God's loving kindness and tender mercies? By remembering, again, his benefits and his covenant towards us. Always remembering he is the covenant-fulfilling God. And even though we don't always keep up our end of the covenant, he, always does. he will. And if we repent, he will bring us back into that. I'd like to quote... Um, and this was found in the Sabbath school lesson. And it says, in reference to remembering and acting, okay, and this is from Hans Lorondel, not to praise God would mean to forget all his benefits, mm -hmm. not to appreciate God's gifts. Only those who praise do not forget. Thinking and speaking about God is not yet praising him. I thought that was interesting, but I understand why. He says, praise begins when one acknowledges God's majesty and works and responds with adoration of his goodness, mercy, and wisdom. Uh, yes, Walter. I other something there. For me, like a David saying to me, Lou Walter, you know what I did. I suppose not to receive nothing from God. But look, your problem got a solution. Maybe your problem is more worse than what I have or less, but don't forget to humble to God, to confess, because he's ready to forgive you through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we have to, to let know people who doesn't know about God, who are, uh, you know, thinking there is no solution for their problems but there is a, a solution. So that's our mission, to talk to them about who is God, how merciful is God. Amen, amen. And I want to close with um, one quote, short quote from Ellen White, where she says, we are to remember and forget not all his benefits. We shall surely be, and this is why we should remember, we shall surely be greatly benefited and strengthened and sustained in recounting the large mercies of our Lord. So let's not forget 
his marvelous mercy, grace, love, and compassion that he's bestowed upon each and every one of us. We need to recite it. We need to share it. No one else has your story, and if you don't share it, it will never be heard. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, everybody. I'm not going to close the way I would have. I just want to do a little quote for the sake of time. We should have been already in church, but uh, let's, uh, I want to read the Steps to Christ from Ellen White and summarizes this lesson pretty well for you and for me. Steps to Christ, page 21 and 22. This is what Ellen White says. It's there on the board, so let's read it. The heart of God yearns over his earthly children with a love stronger than death. You gotta trust that, you gotta believe that. He has poured out to us all heaven in one gift. And she explains. The Savior's life, death, and intercession. The ministry of angels. The pleading of the Spirit. The Father working above and through all the unceasing interest of heavenly beings. All are enlisted in behalf of man's redemption. She goes on to say, Shall we not regard the mercy of God? What more could God do for you and for me? Let us place ourselves in right relation to Him who has loved us with amazing love. Let us unveil ourselves with the means provided for us that we may be transformed into his likeness and be restored to fellowship with ministering angels, to harmony and communion with the Father and the Son. And if this is not good enough for me, then let's read a sentence from Psalm 101. Point six. The voices of God's people join as one in celebration and praise of God's eternal love, saying, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. He is good for His mercy and use forever. Let's pray. Gracious of the Heavenly Father, You have done everything possible for us. Yes. Because you want us to be part of you and the family that you've established. Lord, we seek to have that joy and that privilege. And so, Lord, we want to thank you for your mercies. We want to thank you, Lord, for the transformation that you are willing to, to make in our hearts and our lives. So we may become like you, a lot more like you. To reflect your light and your character. I want to ask the oh Lord that you take our will and mold it into yours. The problem with sin is when we decide to drive the vehicle. Lord, take our will and mold it into yours. And then Lord, I ask, help us die with you at the cross so that when at resurrection you resurrected. We live no more, but you live in us, and we are alive in you. Father, have mercy. Thank you for salvation, and thank you for your goodness. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.